Elden Ring. We are just days away from the launch of From Software's newest release, an open world Souls game. There's a big question though, you know, will this game live up to the ridiculous hype? It's encouraging to me to see posts and responses to that simply stating that it just needs to be a fun Souls game. And on that, we have no worry. From my time playing the game in network tests, we have a massively improved and updated Souls game. And then of course, layered around that is the incredible use of the open world to create what we could argue Souls was always meant to be. It's a very exciting time, but while we still have a few days left to wait, I wanted to make a video about the 10 things I think you should know from my time playing the game in the network test before jumping in and playing yourself. Now, as you may know, Souls games often give you a choice to begin with. Even in Bloodborne, you had to choose a starting weapon. Normally though, it's a pretty important choice. Which class are you gonna start with? These classes provide a variety of base stats that push you towards a more effective start with a certain build in mind. You'll start with with certain weapons and you'll start with certain items. A character you plan to make a heavy weapon user would certainly want higher base strength then as an obvious example. What's cool in Souls though is yeah the starting stats will affect your opening the game and what weapons that you find you can actually use but this can easily be altered to completely change what build you're using late game anyway. Having say three to five extra points in intelligence early game is not really going to matter that much when you've leveled up so many times that you've spent like 50 points or more on all of your stats. In the network test we had a choice of six classes to play around and they had certain things unlocked as well but as it turns out those were actually just the test. What we actually have are a whopping 10 here. We have the awesome looking vagabond and the classic hero, the warrior and oh my god the prisoner who is 100% Griffith under there I'm certain. There's the cool as hell bandit and astrologer, there's the confessor and the samurai and finally the prophet and the iconic wretch previously known as the deprived in other souls games. From their outfits and names I think you'll have a good idea of what the class is meant to be based in but for me my favorite design is either the bandit or the incredible Vagabond. He reminds me of that set in Dark Souls 3, The Fallen Knight, with hidden armor under cloak. I think that's a cool old, like, concept. Let's move on to my second detail then. Exploration. As our first open world Souls game, I was wondering if this would be more of a gimmick than an actual good thing for the game. Souls shines so much with its incredible level design and how often it loops back into itself on a grand scale. Meanwhile, on the smaller scale, the levels also wrap in on themselves, layered on top of each other, under itself, the secret rooms everywhere, treasures inside, ambush spots everywhere, and the big reveals. These level designs are my favorite in all of gaming, so I was definitely concerned when I heard about the open world thing a while back. Fortunately, I was wrong. The main story is still exactly what you'd expect from a Souls game. Big set piece Souls levels, all over the place to go deep into, working just as you would expect them to. But then you've got the open world around that, and that's full of surprises, and often reasons to actually go over there and look around. Tucked away in the hidden caves, the outposts, inside the carriages of the roaming band of brigands, is treasure, and importantly, law. Sometimes I'd step into a crypt and I'd feel like, oh, I'm suddenly in a bloodborne chalice dungeon. Sometimes I was leaping around on my horse and I'd find a secret entrance to an underground layer. The iconic elevator system where you're going down an elevator and then you see a tunnel that if you jump off the elevator sooner, you can go explore. If there's something that catches your eye, there's something going on over there. It's up to you to work out what, and to me, that's good world design. I feel the desire to go over to the thing I'm intrigued by. Now, as I mentioned, there is a lot of secrets to be found, obviously. Exploration has so far been well designed in the test, and like I said, actually worth it. If you engage with the world, there's a good chance there will be something waiting for you. But how do you find the secrets? It's by paying attention. Very obviously on the west side of the network test was an island out on the water, and I wanted to get to that, but I couldn't swim there and my horse certainly couldn't make the jump. So how am I meant to get there? I need to find a way to either go over the water or under it. And since I don't have a glider in this game, at least I don't think they put one in this game, I'm going to need to go under then. Now on this beach, if I look around, I find a cave system. And that of course leads down to these monsters, these beast men that I have to defeat. Now after winning this fight, we don't simply just leave, explore more. Behind the actual boss fight area is another tunnel. And that leads forward and upwards into a different area. And as you come out, you realize where you're standing, on that island which just so happens to be related to the Dragon Covenant. Pretty important. So my advice then is if you see an area or a thing you want to get to, 
you can get to it. So take a look around from all types of angles. Look at it from above, from the sides, from below. Look around to see if you can find secret passages. There might be a surprising way you can get there. And I would strongly say you can. Finally, in regards to exploration, I want to briefly mention just how ridiculously big the map of Elden Ring is looking to be. Obviously, the detail of the areas are pretty impressive, right? It's densely packed with secrets to find, but that was just a very limited area of the network test, you know, just seemingly the opening of the game. We can actually have an early look at what might be there now. See, months ago, this image surfaced, which seems to be concept art for Elden Ring's true map. The area down at the south side is the area we're playing in the network test. There's this area to the south that looks like another island. There's the area to the east, which looks like a huge desert. The massive area, of course, beyond the main story castle to the northwest, leading around this insane crater. We know from the new trailers there's going to be some snowy areas in the game, and we can see snowy areas here in the far north. Even if this is likely not a one-for-one -one showcase of the true map, this gives us a good idea of what to expect, and there's a lot of potential here. What it certainly does tell us is Elden Ring is massive. Let's step away from the big picture stuff now and talk more about some of the new combat details we've seen. Firstly, the Ashes of War, which are essentially the weapon arts we know from Dark Souls 3, but better, a lot more depth to them, and important ways to change the core of your build. Ashes of War can be found in various ways. It's a special item you can find and then apply to a weapon, giving it a new weapon skill to use at the cost of some MP. Now, what's really cool is that most anyone can use Ashes of War because it's tied to your weapon, not the player, which means a low intelligence build can use Ashes of War to essentially cast spells. Now we saw during the network test an awesome set of Ashes of War to attach to our weapons alongside named weapons having their own unique Ashes of War that you can't replace. Shields even have them, like we're able to get a heal Ash of War from the Tree Guardian boss. This really opens up magic to more builds than just spellcasters. So yeah, very exciting because magic is no joke in Elden Ring. Speaking of magic, magic is insane in this game. Not only is it strong as hell, uh, reminding us quite a lot of Demon Souls, but it's got a new important mechanic. You can hold down the spells now to charge or even channel them. We've seen examples of a simple charge resulting in extra damage on the spell if you have the time to do so. Or if you hold down the spell to channel it, you can see longer effects. This is a super small detail, but really important to know as an older Souls fan who's not used to charging the spells. Another magic type then, a magic that's more universal to all builds, is the new NPC summons. Now it's not new that we can summon NPCs to help us in certain areas or boss fights in these games, but they seem to have gone much further with them in Elden Ring. We are able to buy or find summons and then equip them and use them at the cost of MP. These summons are ridiculously strong or even funnily weak in some cases. The most obvious choice for me was the wolves, right? They would summon not one or two wolves, but three to go in there and maul your targets. Super useful when you're fighting a pack of enemies because they help pull aggro from you and distract you from being overwhelmed. It did feel a bit broken to me though when I used it in boss fights. You could use them to draw all the aggro from yourself and then just punish the boss while it's not even paying attention to you. Now the wolves weren't too strong damage wise, but it's just the fact that there was three of them uh, that they were constantly taking aggro from me to let me freely damage a boss. Now there were some ways we could see that they were balancing summons. For example, you can't summon them everywhere, only when you have the symbol on screen that displays it. Meaning there's surely going to be a lot of places you can't summon in help. But all the same, I do hope in the full game that the summons aren't as strong as they were in the network test, but maybe that's just me. Alright, more direct combat based then. This one's really exciting for Dark Souls 2 fans. Power Stance is back. The simple and awesome power that lets you hold two big weapons and then actually use them in unison, in combos. We can do things like jump in the air and plunge attack in this game from anywhere because we have a jump. But with power stance, that means we can jump up in the air and use two, say, big great swords and plunge attack from just a small hop, constantly dealing ridiculous damage. I was seriously abusing this in the test. Power stance just requires you're strong enough to use the weapons and that they're also two weapons of the same type. Then we can go nuts with our dual wielding power and make use of dual wielded heavy weapons again at last. Just keep in mind that you're going to be super, super heavy when you're doing this and be wary of your stamina. 
Here's another pretty insane combat one that I was actually speaking to Josh about yesterday. The new block counter. Josh had actually played the entire network test without knowing this existed because he missed it in the tutorial like many did who literally missed the tutorial. It was weirdly hidden. If you block and take a hit, you can press R2 to retaliate for your own big hit. That hit is actually so strong that it'll often break the enemy's posture, letting you follow up with a critical hit. Now, shield spam was frowned upon in PvP for a long time in Souls. There was even an in-game reference to this playstyle being poked at by the devs in Bloodborne, where shields were not an option. Here, they're kind of doubling down on shields at Sims, giving them a pretty insane way to punish anyone that lands a blow on their simple block. Meaning, I think, heavy shield builds could be finally a lot more relevant. Something to think about. All right, my last note is definitely about the horse. Torrent. This incredible feature lets us sprint around at much greater speeds, which is vital when we're dealing with a huge open world. Its traversal's kind of crazy. The double jump is great, but honestly, it's the fact that we can climb up and around things really easily from Torrent. It doesn't feel fully intended in many cases. Obviously, they've been careful to prevent us doing too much with that, but there are many ways that I could bypass walls or areas that maybe I was supposed to be forced around with clever jumping. So I'm really interested to see how speedrunners are going to use this. But I want you to understand the horse in detail. It has its own health bar, which you need to manage or you'll be knocked down and be stuck laying there while enemies just destroy you. We can feed Torrent raisins from the rower fruit that you find in the world. They're super common and super easy to craft once you have a crafting kit. This way, we can just feed Torrent these raisins and keep him going in a fight. Otherwise, if he does die, we can revive him by visiting a gray spawn fire or using a flask. Combat-wise, we can light and heavy attack from his back, which does feel a bit awkward at first. My idea is to try and like do it and time the attack as we walk into the enemy as that attack ends. But some weapons have unique mount attacks, like the great sword or lances. We can hold the heavy attack and keep channeling it while we run up to an enemy and then collide with it and run through it, which is certainly easier than trying to time the attack, trust me. Lastly, we can also cast spells from horseback. So I've seen cases of spam casting while moving around at high speed, which is, is a really reliable way to take down enemies or even mini bosses from sort of a mobile safety strat. But there you have it, 10 details I wanted to talk about to make you aware of or to at least make you think about going in. It's a very exciting time to have a new Souls game like this. Like Sekiro was incredible, but it didn't have the classic RPG style of Souls that I definitely have missed. Plus the whole lack of PvP and online play, that was huge uh, for the replayability of that game. So it's going to be so good to have that again, but in an open world way like this, I'm, I'm really interested to see how it's going to work. We're going to be covering the game a lot once it releases on the channel, but... Until next time, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is, uh, goodbye.